In the not-so-distant past, as naturalizing landscapes began to take root in urban and suburban communities, neighbors sometimes complained to their local officials that they were uncomfortable with the appearance of the new plant life on their street. By reviewing one such case, the city versus Hager, objections with unmowed landscapes can be examined and ecological lessons can be derived from the sciences addressing each concern. In 1976, Donald Hagar, a wildlife biologist, was cultivating a meadow of varied species around his suburban New Berlin, Wisconsin residence. When neighbors complained to city officials, who, in turn, responded by charging Hager with a host of violations. Hager challenged the city in court. The city claimed Hager's landscape presented a health hazard to allergy sufferers. Botanist David Kapitsky established that the species present in Hager's landscape did not emit a high pollen count. It's true, the flowers and grasses favored by native plant landscapers are not found on seasonal allergy lists. Lawn grass species, however, are, along with ragweed and many common trees. Contrary to most people's perceptions, grasses flower. It is often the flowers and seed heads of ornamental grasses that attract landscape designers to use them. As with more prominently flowering plants, the flowers from grasses bear pollen as part of their reproductive processes. By preventing turf grass species from flowering, pollen emission can be inhibited. This is where the 8-inch height rule, often referenced in mowing ordinances, comes from. By keeping lawn no longer than 8 inches, flowering can be headed off. However, it is not necessary to keep mowing throughout the growing season to prevent flowering, just timing the mowing around late spring and early summer. Although the idea that mowing to prevent pollen disbursement may appear to be the motivation for mowing regulations, if legislation is to be thorough and consistent, all of the other high pollen plants would face equal regulation. This notion was not lost on the judge in Donald Hager's court case, who questioned the city's logic and sincerity in attempting to enforce an ordinance against windborne pollen when the whole of the city was not being examined and indicted equally. Additional information about pollen has come to light in recent years. Some of the plants now bred for the nursery trade are contributing new loads to the pollen count. As noted by the Environmental Protection Agency and addressed in detail by Thomas Ogren in his books about allergy and plants, consumer demand for trees, shrubs, and other perennials which do not litter the landscape with seed, shells, or sprouts has led nurseries to sell male-only pollen-rich plants of some varieties. Back to Hager's case. The city of New Berlin alleged that Hager's landscape was a health hazard because it would attract disease-carrying rats. Forrest Stearns, a University of Wisconsin faculty member and U.S. Forest Service researcher, proved rats cannot succeed in the naturalized garden. Deductive reasoning could have canceled out the very notion of rats flourishing amongst wildflowers. If rats could thrive in the natural landscape, then county, state, and national parks and conservation areas would be overrun. Rats are foragers, relying on the heavy caloric concentration of food associated with human habitation. The city also claimed Hager's vegetation presented a fire hazard. Since fire conditions differ from one part of the country to another, to question this threat is reasonable. Fortunately for Hager, this area of science offers calculations that relate plant moisture content, fuel load, rate of spread, duration of heat, flame length, topography, and fire transmittability. According to the testimony of U.S. Forest Service Representative David Seberg and botany professor 
Philip Whitford, Hager's landscape presented no threat. Note that fire is one of the management tools used by landowners, land managers, and contractors for hire to restore and preserve the integrity of natural landscapes. Neighbors further argued that Hager's landscape, being different, damaged their property values. But satisfying the court that Hager's landscape aesthetic realistically imposed a measurable monetary detriment to the community did not hold up. Today, the notion that natural-looking landscapes reduce property values would be even more difficult to assert, as more and more upscale homes are landscaped with a conservation ethic. The outcome of New Berlin versus Hager is that the court found the city's assertions baseless and Hager's landscape continued to flourish. What Donald Hager's neighbors didn't know back then is that his landscape would provide benefits to the community in the decades to come. Today, cities and counties surrounding Hager's neighborhood have come to advocate for what is known as rain gardens. With the occurrence of flooded basements and overwhelmed infrastructure due to an expansion in impermeable surfaces, that is, buildings and pavement, and because lawns are limited in their ability to absorb rainwater, city and county governments and university extension offices recommend homeowners devote a portion of their property to a garden where water can be retained and absorbed, ideally by deeply rooted native plants. These scenes from the Big Bend property referenced in a prior segment demonstrate how water retaining landscaping can work. This backyard used to flood during heavy rains due to the volume of runoff from neighboring property. This parking lot has also been expanded since this aerial photo was taken. In addition to the quantity itself, the water left standing in the yard bore the colorful sheen of oils and other chemicals washed from the asphalt lot. The solution was to redirect some of the water with a berm and collect the majority in a swale. The swale also receives the water from the house's downspouts, which are directed first to a rubber-lined pond whose overflow is channeled by a ditch to the swale. The swale, or rain garden, is planted with native mesic and wetland plants, and the ditch is spanned by a bridge. Every aspect of the yard was improved and visually enhanced with the pond, swale, and berm system. While some fear an increase in mosquitoes with the presence of a standing water feature, no appreciable increase in mosquito pests was noticed by the property owners, perhaps due to the natural landscaping which harbors toads, frogs, tadpoles, dragonflies, damselflies, and snails all predators of mosquito pupa and larva. However, aquatic pellets that kill mosquitoes are always an option. At the other end of the spectrum, dry sites, native plants again provide solutions. Xeriscaping, which reduces or eliminates the need for irrigation, is most famously used in America's desert southwest. In studies correlating landscaping with human health and safety, a few other issues arise. Many are concerned with the application of pesticides and herbicides on manicured lawns. It is beyond the purview of this program to do more than acknowledge this issue and suggest individuals follow the research and act on their conscience. Unlike the ozone in Earth's stratosphere, which protects us from harmful UV radiation, ozone at ground level hampers breathing. Ground level ozone is formed during warm weather when volatile organic compounds emitted by lawnmowers combine with the nitrogen oxides emitted by automobiles and industrial sources. The inhalation of ozone provokes multiple respiratory problems. According to the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission's 
National Electronic Injury Surveillance System, the injuries that are severe enough to send more than 80,000 Americans to emergency rooms every year, that's two out of every 1,000 ER visits, are the result of proximity to powered lawn mowers. Lacerations, burns, bone fractures, and amputations are the immediate health issues. Impaired healing due to introduction of soil bacteria, skin grafts, and plastic surgery lengthen the impairment and contribute to health care and insurance costs. What is not counted in this safety study is hearing damage, which can result from years of exposure to sounds above 80 decibels. Proceed to video, part three.